Let me start by telling you that the inspiration for this sermon began in the year 1994. It's a few years back. I was living in Hermiston, Oregon. I was teaching remedial reading and math to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. The uh, Hermiston, Oregon is actually, even though it's in Oregon, it's part of the Upper Columbia Conference of the North Pacific Union Conference. It's located right about there. And uh, I taught in the town of Hermiston, but I lived in the nearby town of Echo, Oregon, which is where the Oregon Trail, uh, which is where the Oregon Trail crossed the Umatilla River. Yeah, the town was named after a young girl named Echo Kuntz. And uh, it's the site of Fort Henrietta, which was a small stockade which they built there to help the uh, troops in the area maintain control. And I taught at this place here called Sunset Elementary. And at the time, I drove a 1967 Toyota Stout pickup, uh, kind of a rare beast. There weren't that many of them brought in. It, it had a four on the column shifter, which was a little bit unusual. But anyway, I was attending the Hermiston Seventh-day Adventist Church at the time. And uh, it was a very interesting, a very large church. And it had a really, uh, the sanctuary was you know, quite large, probably twice the size of this one. And every Sabbath morning, they had a choir that would start off the worship service by singing Praise to the Lord, hymn number one. And the choir was split into two pieces. And they'd each march down as they were singing, playing. Then they would get up on the platform. They would cross. And they would all sit down. And uh, it was the first time I ever remember hearing that song. And then one day I discovered this. Oh, it's, that's the hymn number one. I said, well, that's pretty cool. So, but uh, I didn't choose that only for this reason for this morning. I chose it because I really like it. I think it's a great hymn. So what happened was one morning while I was there, I was asked, hey, uh, coming up in a few weeks, uh, we're going to give a call for what we call a birthday thank offering. It was an offering they took once a month. Uh, they just called it a birthday thank offering. And it was to raise money to help uh, for the local poor people, as I recall. And so they asked me if I would be the one to call for that offer that day. And I says, okay, yeah, sure, I'll go ahead and do that. So I went home and I started thinking about, well, what am I going to say when I call for this offering? And I started to compile a list of things that I was thankful for. I was thankful for, you know, my health and the fact that I had a job and that I had an intact family and I had a nice home. I had vehicles. They might have been old, but they still worked. And in fact, I had somebody tell me that your pickup truck is older than I am when I was one of my colleagues at work. Well, anyway, it's kind of beside the point. But, but as I was putting this together, I was arrested in my thoughts by this thought, and that was, what about the people who don't have those things? They're going to hear you get up there and rattle off a list of things that you're thankful for. What if they're in the midst of struggling because they've lost something? And I said, yeah, that wouldn't be very cool, would it? So I thought, well, I'm going to have to revamp this. So I better dig a little deeper and do a little more research on this idea of thankfulness. And of course, it brought me to this psalm that we heard a little bit ago. But the more the scriptures I read, the more that something became clear. And that was that I really needed to rethink my understanding of thankfulness. What does it mean? What does it mean from a biblical standpoint to be thankful? Now, to assist us in understanding this concept, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I see in this audience, I think we're going to be okay, or at least a majority of you. Raise your hand if you remember what movie this is from. Oh, good. Okay, so uh, for if, in case you don't, okay, for the few of you who didn't raise your hand, this is the movie, The Sound of Music. Uh, it debuted in, on April 1st, 1965, written by Rogers and Hammerstein. And there was a particular scene in that movie. It was the dinner scene where uh, Maria is entering late, and she sits on a pine cone and uh, causes a little disruption. And then they all get ready to start eating, and Maria says, Excuse me, Captain, haven't we forgotten to thank the Lord? And then she offers a prayer. And this was the prayer that she said. She said, for what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. Now, I submit to you that this is a prayer that will not be answered. Now, why do I say that? Well, here's where we have a problem. God does not bestow thankfulness. He requires it for our benefit. 
Now I'm going to spend the next part of this worship hour this morning backing up my point. The word thanks appears in the Bible 110 times in 108 verses in the New American Standard Bible. In 103 of those, it is preceded either by give thanks, giving thanks, give you thanks, or gave thanks. In the other, ver in the other verses, it reads, but thanks be to God. Okay, so it never said that God gives us thankful feelings. But we all know what the fruit of the Spirit is, right? In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It doesn't say thankfulness is something that the Spirit gives us. Okay? Now, these are all, this is a great list. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but appreciation or thankfulness is something that we are told to cultivate. Interestingly, the word thankful only appears once, and it is in Colossians 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Being thankful is a directive, and it's directed at believers. So then, just to kick us off, a preliminary study would show us that the Bible tells us to either give thanks or to be thankful. It doesn't say anywhere that God will make us thankful. Rather, cultivating a thankful attitude is what God wants from us to open ourselves up to his blessings, his spirit, his forgiveness, and his salvation. And that is the premise that I want you to take away from today's message. Now I'm going to, like I said, spend the remainder of my time backing that up. There are many occurrences of the word thanks in the Old Testament, okay, particularly in Psalms, but I'm going to stick for the New Testament, with the New Testament today, just for brevity's sake and because it would just keep adding to what we have to say. But I think we can cover it all just from the New Testament. Primarily, in the Gospels in the book of Acts, the word thanks appears 11 times, and in all but twice, it is associated with a meal, the loaves and fish, Passover supper, in the rest of the New Testament, it shows up five times in the book of Romans, five times in 1 Corinthians, five times in 2 Corinthians, three times in Ephesians, three times in Colossians, three times in 1 Thessalonians, two times in 2 Thessalonians, shows up one time in Hebrews, and twice in Revelation. Can you think of another verb that might express the same attitude as thankfulness? Rhetorical question, you're thinking. How about the word rejoice, okay? We're familiar with that one too. The word rejoice appears 149 times in 145 verses. Can we see that this is an important concept if it's been included that many times? So, I'm gonna spend a few minutes going over some of my favorite things. I mean, some of my favorite scripture verses, okay? That deal with rejoicing and thanks and thanksgiving. The first is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Notice how Paul writes this. He writes it as a directive. He's telling the Thessalonians, rejoice. He wants them to do this. Now, regarding this verse, we've heard that it doesn't say, uh, for everything, give thanks. It says, in everything, give thanks, okay? Because we are going to have unfortunate circumstances that come our way. Disadvantages are gonna strike us, okay? Uh, unpleasant news is gonna hit us. It doesn't say that we're today, oh, thank you for this trial, okay? Now, you, you could say that if you wanted to. I'm not encouraging you to do that. But it says that in everything, we need to remember to always have an attitude of thankfulness. Well, that's well and good when the times are well and good, but what about during tough times? Well, that's a fair question. Okay, can you think of anybody who had it tougher than, say, Job? Uh, would anybody here volunteer to go through a situation like Job went through voluntarily? No, I don't expect us to raise our hand. But what was Job's response? In Job 1.21, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Or, or maybe you've come across this one. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, 
which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. So does that mean that we are supposed to uh, keep on rejoicing even during our trials? Uh, yeah, but you know, there might be somebody, there might be somebody out there in the back of their brain are thinking, yeah, but I'd rather whine about my problems. Well, I'm sorry, whining is prohibited, okay? So yeah, we're gonna take whining off the table. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can't confide privately to somebody who may be able to give you counseling or advice if you're going through a difficult situation, okay? Uh, during a very dark period of my life, I needed someone to talk to, and God had provided me with just that person. So, uh, but that was, and it was invaluable to me, okay? But just to carry on for the sake of carrying on, not good. So, we have heard about stop global warming. I'm going to suggest we also say stop global whining. All right. <laughs> Philippians 2.14 tells us to do how many things? Most things? All things without grumbling or disputing. I think we could safely substitute whining into that verse as well, if we want to make another modern paraphrase. How about Hebrews 13, <coughs> verse 15? Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Or these verses, Philippians 4, verse 5 and 6. Be anxious for nothing. Okay, not a few things. Okay, so if you f think that you're a person who wrestles with anxiety, consider this. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with Thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, that sounds like a really good thing, which surpasses all comprehension, which means it's amazing, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, in the same chapter, Paul writes this in Philippians 4, verse 11. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Well, if you read the book of Acts, you'll know that Paul went through some really rough stretches there, right? Two other examples where the phrase be content appears. Uh, the first one is in Luke chapter 3, referring to John the Baptist. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, What about us? What shall we do? And I joined, I became a Christian at the time I was working full time for the Army National Guard. So I was a soldier at the time. And so this verse was uh, particularly of interest to me. And he, being John the Baptist, said to them, Do not take money from anyone by force. I wasn't doing that, or accusing anyone falsely. Well, I didn't think I was doing that. And be content with your wages. Okay, and that's it? That's all he has to say to soldiers? Well, all right, what else does he have to say? Well, we moved on to 1 Timothy 6, 6, 8. I eventually ran across that verse, these verses. But godliness is actually a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Ooh, it sounds like Paul had been reading Job, right? If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Now, I had a dear friend, John, and his wife, Marge. Uh, they're, they're now sleeping, awaiting the resurrection. Uh, John was a very, uh, he was, became a really close friend of mine. He, uh, he helped out in the creator role division in the church I attended for many years. And everybody called him Grandpa John. And he was a delightful guy. But uh, one, one day he shared a saying with me. And it was this, if we could hang our problems out on a line, you'd still pick yours and I'd still pick mine, okay? Meaning what? It, meaning that if we do an inventory of all of our problems and then we look at somebody else, we don't have to look very far before we'll find somebody who says, you know what, I, I wouldn't want to trade my problems for theirs. I'll keep the ones I've got, thank you very much. Have we ever had a rotten situation that we've had to deal with? Okay, if you haven't, then I don't know where you've been, or where you've been hiding, or which planet you've been living on. We don't have to look very far to find other people who are suffering. And in, in our prayer this morning, you know, we brought to mind the fact that right now in the world, there is a lot of chaos, a lot of turmoil, a lot of suffering. Okay, a lot of people unfairly dealing with consequences that are way beyond their control. 
And I hope that as we pray for them, that they will find encouragement and that they will find the Lord through their sufferings if they don't already know him. But what else does Paul write about being thankful? Well, we go to Colossians and we look at chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of, yep, thanksgiving. Notice that it says keeping alert, okay? Alert for what? Alert so that we don't slip into an attitude of grumbling or complaining, okay? We need to guard ourselves so that we don't fall back into old patterns that we may have developed before we were a Christian. 1 Timothy 1.12 tells us this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. So let me turn around and ask you all a question right now. Not to be answered out loud, just a rhetorical question, but are you thankful today that the Lord Jesus has called you into his service? Yeah. Well, I hope so. 2023 has been an awesome year to be a Christian, filled with a lot of interesting things, but there's been a lot of good that has shined through the darkness. Well, <clears throat> if having an, a thankful attitude came naturally to the Christian, okay, if having a thankful attitude came naturally to the Christian, why are there so many reminders in God's word to remember to be thankful? Okay, again, it's because he's saying, this is what you need to do. This is the avenue by which you gain access to the blessings that God has. Uh, but uh, we can, we can cultivate that attitude of thanksgiving if we put our mind to it. Continuing on in 1 Timothy, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. And that would include women and children as well too. Now, let's switch over and look at some of these references I mentioned to rejoicing, okay? 2 Corinthians 13, 11 tells us, Finally, brethren, rejoice. Again, this is an imperative. It's a command. He's telling the Corinthians, do this. Be made complete. Be comforted. Be like-minded. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And then he says in Philippians 3, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. And later in Philippians, he tells us this, as if we hadn't got it by now already, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And Peter had a few things to say about rejoicing as well. In 1 Peter 1.6, he says this, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Peter recognized that people were going to be going through distressing times, and he tells them to remember to rejoice also. And in Verse 8, Peter says this, And though you have not seen him, we know who him is, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. That's, inexpressible means it's like you don't even know how to put into words how to be thankful. But when you do an inventory, when you really spend time looking at God and counting your blessings one by one, then you begin to realize, hey, I don't have it as, nearly as bad as I thought I had it. Does anybody know what the last verse in the Bible that mentions rejoicing would be? Well, last verse Bible, you're thinking maybe Revelation. Yep, you'd be right. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Who is the bride? One question comes up. Does the Bible mention what happens to those who don't give thanks? As a matter of fact, it does. Romans 1, 18 through 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, understood through his workmanship. That is why uh, I appreciate the study of what's going on in the created world and looking at God's handiwork. This phrase, what has been made, that is it translated only one other time in the New Testament, talking about we being his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. But it pulls together here, 
for even though they, the unbelievers, the scoffers, knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. And what was the result? They became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Doesn't sound like a path I want to go on. I don't think you all want to go on it either. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So when people do not recognize the handiwork of God, whether it's the handiwork of God through our lives, because we are his workmanship, or through his handiwork, the things that have been made, they become futile, and they'll turn to anything else. They'll turn to aliens, UFOs, demons, okay, all kinds of nasty things. But our security, our comfort, our peace is found in God, and we need to learn about God through his word. So let's look at what Paul says about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. Romans 4.19, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. And verse 20, as it reads in the New American Standard Bible, says this, Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. The Revised Standard Version reads this way, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. In other words, Abraham knew how to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Attitude of gratitude. Again, I'm going to say it. God does not give us an attitude. He doesn't give us a good attitude. He doesn't give us a bad attitude. Okay? We choose our attitude. So, which attitude is the obvious best choice to make? Well, who here recognizes this person here? All right, does anybody? Raise your hand if you think you know who this guy is. Oh, this is Dave Ramsey. He is a Christian financial advisor. He does financial freedom and stuff like this. He has a radio show. And uh, when people call in and they, he says, how are you doing? They say, how are you doing, Dave? And does anybody know what his answer is? He says, I'm doing better than I deserve. Okay. Well, um, you know, think about it. Can't we all say this? Are, are we all doing better than we deserve? What do we deserve as sinners? Huh, yeah, we don't even want to mention it, right? We don't even, because we know as sinners, we don't deserve. Do we deserve God's grace? Do we deserve God's mercy? No, but because he is gracious, because he is loving, because he cares so much about us, because we are made in his image, he gives us grace. And he reveals himself to us so that we can enter into that relationship with him and have all those blessings come about in its train. Romans 5, 6 tells us this. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He goes on. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. I love this part, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise the Lord. Well, it is praise the Lord. And then he goes on from there. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. But it doesn't stop there. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now, this word reconciliation, what does that mean? How are we supposed to understand it in the context of today? 2 Corinthians 5.18 tells us, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All these things are from God, and they're yours. To share. Why? Because God has abundantly provided them. And he says, I want you to be a part in me. We mentioned in Sabbath school, the co-mission. Okay? Co-operation. Okay? This is God's plan. He wants, what? How many people to be saved? It is not the will of God that any should perish, but that most people, all should come to repentance. He wants, God wants to save as many people as he possibly can. Okay? Uh, uh, if you want a metaphor... He's planning a party in heaven. He wants there to be as big a, a attendance there as possible. Okay? All these things are from God. God abundantly provides. And in 2 Corinthians 5.19, namely, 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Not counting our trespasses against us. When Jesus hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Was he only talking about the centurions? I believe he was speaking to all of us as well. That he says, I don't hold your past against you. I just want you back in relationship with me. Some time ago, I, before I closed my Facebook account, because I didn't like what uh, Zuckerberg had to say about what they could do with our information, I ran across this, they call it a meme, right? It said, what if when you woke up this morning, all you had was what you had given thanks for yesterday? And I thought, well, that's kind of good, but it's kind of a despairing thought because uh, if you woke up this morning and had lost everything you hadn't given thanks for, then you're stuck, right? So I said, how about we turn that around? So I rewrote to say this, what if when you wake up tomorrow, all you had was what you had given thanks for today? That still gives you time to fix the problem, right? Thankfulness, I saw this one time. Thankfulness is the soil in which joy thrives. Anybody here want to have a joyless life? No, we want to have a joyful life. So we cultivate thankfulness. Cultivating thankfulness in your heart each day will open the way for you to experience God's love and joy and peace in your life. It really is that simple. Now, that's been my experience in my life, and I don't consider myself to be anybody special, okay? So if it works in my life, it will work in your life as well, okay? But you have not to have to take my word for it. I've given you plenty of scripture references to show you how it works, and it's for y'all, all, all y'all, all y'all as well, okay? Now, will this message possibly affect the content of your prayers tomorrow? Well, I hope it doesn't. I hope you're already giving thanks, cultivating an attitude of thankfulness. I hope you're already pouring out thanksgiving to God every day for all the good things that he's done. Perhaps you had a wicked childhood. Perhaps you had a miserable youth. It doesn't matter. You can still give thanks. It doesn't matter if you have a problem like Maria. You can still give thanks. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can be 16 going on 17 or 69 going on 70. You can still give thanks thanks. You can be a corporate executive or a lonely goat herd. It doesn't matter. You still give thanks. First and foremost, you give thanks. And first and foremost, we remember that it was the cross of Calvary that makes all of this possible for us in our lives. We need to remember that God is good all the time, and he wants to be our friend to have a personal relationship with us. And when we cultivate the relationship and the attitude of thanksgiving, we get all of his blessings. 2 Corinthians 5.18 reminds us, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Look familiar? I'm just repeating. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and he doesn't count their trespasses against them or against us, but he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Hebrews 12, 28 reminds us, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. So, let us be thankful. So, that's how we do our part. And we do that by serving God acceptably. Now, stop and think for a moment, please, if you will. When somebody shows you appreciation for something that you did for them, how does it make you feel? When somebody does, goes out of their way to do something special for you, don't you just feel like, a, like wow, that was so cool, you know? It's, it's really neat. I like it. I love it. Well, you know what? We were created in God's image. So when we do things for God, he can take delight. And uh, we have the privilege of being able to have that kind of interaction with God. Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want you to have confidence in your approach to God as well, okay? 
as you come to God, know that he is every bit as good as he says he is in his word, and he wants to bless you, and he wants you to have life, and that more abundantly. Now, I'm going to end this uh, message today with a what I'll call a case study, okay? Uh, in your brain right now, I'm not going to ask for a survey here, but just think about somebody in the Gospels who had an encounter with Jesus and who was thankful for that encounter. You might have been thinking of Mary Magdalene. Maybe you're thinking of Lazarus. Maybe the widow of Nain. Maybe the Roman centurion. How about leper number 10? Or the woman at the well? Or the Syrophoenician woman? Or maybe Bartimaeus? Or maybe the lame man at the pool of Bethesda? Or the blind man made well at the pool of Siloam? Well, uh, these are all good candidates, but I can think of one other. Mark 5, verses 1 through 20, tells us of a man. We know him only as the Gerasene demoniac. Now, many of us have heard that when we're reading the Gospels, that we should try to put ourselves in the place of the narrative, right? We should try to make ourselves into the character of, that we're reading. Well, that's a really good idea. And so, somebody has done that. A guy by the name of Bob Bennett, he's a Christian musician, and back in 1989, he published a, an album called Matters of the Heart, and in it, he sang a song, which I'm going to have that be, well, our closing prayer, if you will. 